Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, Chris Smith, and Jeff. Wow, thank you, Jeff. Brand new patron at a very big level, mind you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, On Jeff. this episode of DTNS, Molly Wood helps us work through how the U.S. is doing after spending all that Chips Act money. Is it helping? And who is it helping exactly? Plus, why rumors of Google's demise are greatly exaggerated and why Apple Vision Pro sales numbers may not matter much at all. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 26th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From The Town, a.k.a. Oakland, I'm Molly Wood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Yes, um, and Sarah, do you need to explain to Molly why it's called Animal House? Or was showing her your cat earlier on the camera <laughs> enough, do you think? I mean, I, I feel like Molly, you know, understands uh, yeah. that at yeah. any time there may be an animal in my lap or my hand. So, yeah. It, if you listen animal to Good House Day Internet, is. you know that Ralphie has been kind of trying to wedge his way into the show lately. So He is, yeah, I don't know. I have to put him in acting class or something. He's <laughs> like, oh, I want to be on the show. We have to get him under contract is what we got to do. Mm -hmm. All right. While Ralphie bides his time, let's start with the quick hits. Snap's worth paying a little attention to these days because it's already benefiting from TikTok uncertainty. And if ByteDance does leave the U.S. market, Snap may benefit all that much more, albeit not as much as Instagram and YouTube. That said, Snap's 21% increase in revenue comes before the impact of much of that, and Snap said it was driven by improvements in its own advertising program. The company also made money, three cents a share, rather than the loss that analysts expected. Global daily active users reached 422 million, that's up 10% on the year, and total watch time on its TikTok competitor Spotlight increased 125%. Look at you, Snap. Yeah, well, you know, when you have a low number, it's easy to go up by high percentage. I suppose. But, it's know, all up good from here. Them. So cold. I know. I'm sorry, Snap. Uh, how about Microsoft? Microsoft reported overall revenue up 17%. Uh, that include Office Commercial, LinkedIn, the cloud, which includes Azure, Windows OEM, content and services, and gaming revenue all up. Now, gaming revenue rose 51%, mostly because Microsoft now owns Activision Blizzard and it didn't a year ago. Uh, it probably would have gone down a little bit if that were not true. But the only section that actually was down was devices, down 17%. Uh, that includes Xbox hardware and the Surface laptops, which are due for a refresh. Xbox fell 31%. So this leaves us to conclude that Microsoft is still a cloud company through and through. Uh, that's where the majority of its money came from and the bulk of its growth. And its AI business already starting to pay off. They said it contributed 7% to Azure revenue. Apple removed three apps from the App Store that advertised creating non-consensual nude images as one of their features. 404 Media found advertisements on Instagram that users could undress people for free with links to apps on the App Store. The apps were described more neutrally, of course they were. One was called an art generator. Apple only removed the apps that 404 Media reported to them. There may mm. be more. There's probably more. Uh, Intel sales were down with revenue below what was expected, though profitability was okay, beating expectations, and they made money. Intel's forecast for the next quarter, though, was below what investors wanted to hear in both earnings and revenue. And its new foundry business, which makes chips for others and is an essential part of its diversification strategy, was down 10% on the year. The one bright spot was chip sales for PCs, which rose 31%. CEO Bob Gelsinger continues to say this is a long-term turnaround, which it is. Very, very long. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai, and NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang have joined a U.S. federal advis advisory board focused on implementing AI tools in critical infrastructure safely. The Artificial Intelligence Safety and Security Board, as it's known, will work with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to develop recommendations for power grid operators, manufacturers, transportation providers, and others. In addition to the CEOs, the panel also includes almost two dozen academics, civil rights leaders, and other company executives. The board will hold its first meeting in May and then meet quarterly after that. The AISS board, or 
if you hyphenate AI. Ace. I yes. yeah, we see where you're going with that. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless, I'm thrilled that it exists. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a good thing, that, <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, Here's the story you probably have heard about Alphabet, a.k.a. Google. Uh, search ad revenue is threatened. It's behind on AI, and it can't compete in cloud services. What's it going to do? Well, Alphabet's latest earnings report counters all of that narrative. Search revenue rose 14%. So it's doing fine for now, might still have a problem in the future, but YouTube ad revenue could be a future bright spot. It boosted enough to make up 10% of Alphabet's overall revenue. Just to, to repeat that, YouTube ad revenue alone made up 10% of Alphabet's overall revenue. Google Cloud made up a slightly higher percentage than 10%, showing that Google is now pretty competitive in this space with a somewhat faltering AWS and of course, very strong Microsoft Azure. As for AI, jury's still out on that one, uh, but at least it has the cash to keep throwing at it. And even its other bets, which is all the non-Google, non-YouTube stuff, like Waymo, for example, saw revenue rise from 288 million a year ago to 495 million. And it's still losing money on the other bets, but it's losing less money than it did a year ago. So Molly, does this mean the rumors of Google's decline are greatly exaggerated? I mean, I suppose that rumors often are, mm, <laughs> but it is a pretty good reminder that even a company with a little bit of catching up to do in this case, Google, I mean, Google, look, it still has a monopoly in search. So no matter what happens, it's going to take a very long time for Google to really see major hits to its business. I mean, YouTube, we should never be sleeping on. YouTube makes a ton of money. I also wonder how much of these earnings have been boosted by the layoffs that Google has done recently because they've made it pretty clear that they're sort of reinvesting. Uh, they've saved a lot of money in a lot of these divisions. So I think a lot of things are happening and all of them look not well, bad and for Google. Google, Meta, Apple, I mean, a lot of Amazon, I mean, a lot of huge companies with, you know, like many thousands of employees have trimmed the fat, so to speak. And that usually ends up looking good on, exactly. you know, you know, your next earnings. I think it's interesting that search revenue for Google rising 14%. Uh, that is, I mean, it, listen, this is what Google is good at. Google is trying to make inroads in AI. One might argue they're they're trying to catch up to, you know, OpenAI and Microsoft and even Meta. You know, it, it all it's a, we're early days there. But as long as Google can uh, can can do what it does really well, I I don't think it's in a lot of hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Molly, your point about, you know, it's going to take a long time for an impact on Google search with the monopolistic position it's in is a very, very good one. Uh, it's it's revenue rising 14 percent, I think, is 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 a good sign that it's still growing. Right. It's still it's yeah. not being hurt yet. But I think we may be overestimating in our minds, some of us, the impact that AI would have on search. You know, on the one hand, you hear people saying, AI, it hallucinates and doesn't give you anything accurate. And the other hand, it's going to kill search. And it's like, well, both of those aren't going to be true at the same time. So I think we're more towards the first than the second uh, right now. And that's good for Google. I think the impressive thing in this is Google Cloud, uh, because mm -hmm. that has been a huge question mark for a decade for Google. And it seems like they are finally starting to make that that space competitive in a way that they hadn't before. They were sort of like, oh, don't forget Google also has cloud. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And they've been super aggressive about selling it. And let's let's do put a finer point on what you said about AI and search, because you know, the the products that I have been most excited about are things like Arc Search, which you know, just, mm -hmm. yes, it can use Google on the back end, but if I have it browse for me, it just generates a page of results, which frankly, <laughs> Google increasingly does not do. It generates a page of ads yeah. and then eventually some results. And so I do think that despite this strong showing, and we're not going to see major dents in this core business for a, a while, there's still a real question about how an ad supported business like Google integrates AI into search without cannibalizing itself. Yeah. Or, or if it does cannibalize itself, can it make money from other stuff? Right. Which was a bigger question before this earnings report in my own mind. Uh, but seeing YouTube uh, gaining and seeing cloud gaining makes me think, 
All right, there's at least the possibility, there's the kernel of a possibility, it's certainly not assured, uh, that, that Google could diversify. And who knows, maybe even something will come out of that other bets uh, section at some point and finally provide a business that we've been covering since we were both doing Buzz Out Loud in 2009. Yep, you got I mean, this other bets. I don't, I don't know about uh, everybody else, but I've been enjoying the AI um, Google uh, experiments where I search for a term and it's like, here's here's all the stuff that you probably expected to get, but here's the here's the paragraph that we think might be helpful. Yes, I like that. You know, too. I mean, mm -hmm. Google, I you like know, it. It, it's trying to put AI into products that people know and trust yeah, and yeah. know how to use. Yes, and I and think that's always they're doing really a good job with that presentation. Exactly. And so the question is like, can they make the interface? like still serve ads and still make plenty of money on ads, but also just give me the freaking answer that I want efficiently. So I don't have to spend so much time looking yeah. at all those ads. Yeah. yeah. And if it's oh, a man, recipe, don't tell me your life story. Just tell oh, me what I need to buy God. at Ralph's. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. How <laughs> Can they thread the needle of telling you the recipe without sending you to the page that tells you the life story, if that's not what you want uh, and still make money off that. All right. Earlier this week, we passed along the news that Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo uh, forecast, cut his forecast for Apple Vision Pro headset shipping, claiming production was being cut as low as 400,000 units for this year, which was down from expectations of 700,000. And a lot has been made about like, well, what did Apple actually say? And what, when did they say what? And was it raised and then lowered, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this came after a related report from Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who noted some anecdotal stuff uh, that sales seem to be way down at locations in Apple retail. Uh, and Gadget weighed in today saying, well, hold on, and I'm gonna quote, it doesn't actually matter how many headsets Apple sells. And if you say, well, of course it does, why wouldn't it? Uh, and Gadget breaks this down. Uh, noting that the lower 400,000 number um, is significant and maybe not significantly bad. The Vision Pro sells for $3,500, give or take, you know, whether you get some accessories type thing, depending on the package that you buy, which gives Apple around $1.4 billion in sales at this point. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money for Apple. The company brought in $383 billion in 2023 with around $90 million in net income. Apple is printing money. So the Vision Pro's numbers would account for 1% of the company's total revenue. So at this rate, not a revenue driver, but again, and Gadget's argument is, does that really matter? If Apple can build out the killer app store, doesn't really have it yet, but if that is something that can be achieved for spatial computing and replicate the mobile app store that it has had wild success with at some point, Molly, what do you think? Is this a long game or, you know, is the Vision Pro just simply too expensive? I think it's a long game and I like Engadget sort of doing this back of the envelope math on revenue and what it actually means for Apple. Now, the thing that we do not know about the Vision Pro is the total cost of R&D and the margins, right? We don't know how much it costs to make this device. Knowing Apple, it's probably substantially less than $3,500 because they're very good at, right, wringing profit out of the devices that they sell. But I 100% agree that it doesn't matter how many they sell unless shareholders start to get uncomfortable with the amount of money that they're spending to develop it. Because we saw that happen with Meta and the the push into VR and into uh, you know spending a ton of, of money on something that consumers pretty definitively said they didn't want. So the thing that Apple has going for it that Meta didn't have is that they haven't changed the name of the company. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they haven't said, we're betting the entire future of the company on this one product and this one development line. They've said, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, if it's a $1.4 billion business, maybe, you know, a $400,000 profit, like, that's fine. And yeah. I do think it's good enough from what I, I mean, I haven't tried it, Sarah, you have, but like, even just... I don't know, even just like a friend sent me a video of the interaction with it. And I was like, yeah, I would totally use that for work in two and a half years when it's a thousand dollars. That's the key in two and a half years. Right. And I think Apple knows that. And Gadget's point is well taken. Uh, 
Apple's got plenty of cash. So mm -hmm. even if they did lose money on this for the first two and a half years, they don't care. As long as they are confident that they will build this into a business that is as successful as the Apple Watch even. It doesn't even have to be as successful as the iPhone, but I bet they're hoping it will be. Uh, and that is something that they seem confident in. They the, the leaks have said internally, Apple says, oh yeah, it's the third or fourth generation. That's the one everybody's gonna want. Um, so this is them getting it out in the market because they know until they get it at scale being used, they can't improve it as fast as they would otherwise. And so they're selling overpriced developers kits to people uh, to test that. It is a little bit different than the iPhone or the Apple Watch, which were, I think, more fully formed products uh, when right. they were launched. But well, it's the same strategy. Products. Yeah, yeah. You know? And consumer, yeah, I mean, more consumer product, too. Yeah. I mean, the Vision Pro, as cool as it is, you know, that's a tough sell. I mean, if somebody had cash to burn and said, should I get this? I'd be like, well, what do you want to do? You know, if they said, should I get an Apple Watch? I'm like, yeah, of course, get your steps in. Uh, you know, iPhone, you know, that's easy. iOS, store, you know, that's all been established. That's consumer stuff. The Vision Pro is not a consumer product. It can be, and I think it is designed to be one, but right now it's Apple saying, we give developers something pretty cray cray to, you know, to, to make, you know, beautiful things with. We're starting to see stories come out, you know, uh, in the medical field. Great, not a consumer product. Like yeah. what, wh when does it become a consumer product? Because as you mentioned, Molly, with Meta has been going all in on, you know, VR for, for years uh, with, you know, some success for sure. But I mean, the vision, or, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the uh, the Meta Quest Two is now you know under two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So I mean, these are that's a consumer product. And even then, it's a so all of that positivity aside, even then, it's a consumer product with relatively limited demand and a high rate of abandonment in a and a technology that consumers just over and over and over have not adopted on mass. Right. Like, uh, yes, there are various reasons for it, including it not being very good over the last like 70 years that we've been trying to make uh, VR a thing. But so I, I do think that right now it doesn't matter how many of these things they sell. It is not a good signal to the market. Anytime you demonstrate that the demand is not what you thought it was. Mm -hmm. And I still think the jury is out on whether people want to live in VR, especially like it's just bad timing at a moment when people are so freaking excited to go out in the world and like see each other's outfits and hang out. It's it's not what I want to do. If I had to figure out a path for success for the Apple Vision Pro, it would be that a future generation, I don't know if it's the third, fourth or otherwise, competes with the meta Ray-Bans. It's it's a better right. version, right? Like it's, it's Google Glass. Yeah, that it's maybe maybe cooler looking fashionably, like with their Apple Watch sense, uh, but can do more uh, while you're able to see the world around you, because that is what the Apple Vision Pro tries to do very clunkily, oh, you know, I mean, by that, showing you showing yeah. your eyes on the front, uh, you know, and, and maybe they get better at that, <laughs> so it's not so weird looking. I don't remember what uh, sitcom this was a joke in, but it was like, the world is not ready for this. And that is exactly how I feel anytime I walk outside with a Vision Pro on my face. I can see the world, the world not ready for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm all in on the Google Glass version, though. I mean, like, I want I want this future where I have an augmented heads up display everywhere. I want the freaking contact lens. Like, give it to me. Yeah, right. I think that's where it's all going. That's what consumers want, it seems like that because people are Maybe. way more enthusiastic over the ray beds than they are over the quest well because yeah. you have to wear sunglasses already so right why not make yeah. them smart yeah do you don't yeah. i mean fundamentally and like scott galloway makes this point over and over and over on the pivot pod like don't mess up my face like i'm out in the world yeah. don't be making my face look weird i'm you know it's just it's just like <laughs> biological somehow i have enough problems already don't <laughs> screw with my face help me out yeah. here yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm ready for the world, but is the world ready for me? <laughs> All right. Uh, the show called Top 5 has existed in many forms, most of which have been hosted by me, uh, from Cena to Twit to uh, Revision 3 uh, to now our own YouTube channel. And this version is short, only 60 seconds. This week, I count down the Top 5 Tech Demo Fails. 
you, you can't not watch this. It's only going to take you 60 seconds. And I give you the best tech demo fails ever. Roger did a great job editing it, them in so you get just that part where it fails. Uh, go watch it, folks. It's at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, DNS pick, DTNS Picks on Instagram, and YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. In an opinion column for the Financial Times, Chris Miller, author of the book Chip War, writes that the $39 billion Chips Act in the U.S. has so far been a success. Among his arguments for considering it a success, 15-fold increase in chip plant construction, chip makers and supply chain partners investing uh, $327 billion over the next 10 years, a lot of money going toward this, which has spurred similar investment in uh, Japan and Europe, which, at least in theory, will help supply chain resiliency overall. Molly, we were talking before the show. You have thoughts. I know, because I'm such a freaking weirdo. No, I just, I love this story because I think it's a it's a success story, and we should be clear that those investments we just mentioned, the 15-fold increase in chip plant construction and the $327 billion over the next 10 years, are in the United States. And so this is a this is sort of a direct line to economic success in the United States, to decentralized production, because we saw that that was obviously a nightmare during the pandemic that caused people to not be able to get everything from Oculus's to cars. And so this you know, the groundbreaking has already occurred. And when you look back at, for example, the Intel earnings, right? And you, you have Intel talking about how this is such a long process. Part of the process, part of the reason it's such a long turnaround story for Intel, I'm not saying the CHIPS Act is going to single-handedly fix Intel's problems, but being able to incentivize the construction and development of those unbelievably expensive and complex foundries and manufacturing facilities is major. And then of course, I personally am thrilled because the CHIPS Act also includes a ton of money for US research and development. And I could just stop there, right? Because research and development in the United States has not been funded from the government at levels that it should be for like the last 50 or 60 years. So that would already be great, but also like $67 billion of it is for research and development around climate technologies. And so some of this chip development will go into creating smart grids and uh, you know more efficient power generation and distribution and all of these things that end up being the kind of efficiency that saves a lot of money and is good for the planet. There, there's there's good ways and bad ways to fund R and D, uh, but I, I'm I I don't think it's productive to get into you know nitpicking on it. I I think the the fact that they are trying to do the right thing is good enough for me for now. Uh, I do wonder sometimes. I was gonna say, what's the nitpicking that you want to do though? Because yeah, I want to nitpick on something else exactly. Then. Right? Is it uh, the grants part? I do <laughs> wonder sometimes if this is the equivalent of taking off our shoes at the airport. Uh, so we had this Building one, once and forever pandemic yeah. and suddenly everyone's panicking about moving uh, stuff out so we don't have a supply chain issue if there's a pandemic again. Um, I think there's lots of other good reasons to do it too and maybe that's enough. But part of me is like, yeah, but... You know, there are a lot of advantages to the price of the goods you have if you are finding the most economically advantageous place to, to build it. And people don't realize that if you put it in a more expensive place, you're going to drive up the price sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I think that's 100 percent true. And also the the climate trade offs of manufacturing so you have double you have a double trade off right i think there were concerns about the centralization of the supply chain even before the pandemic right you sure. had intel spending about a decade trying to figure out how to make it economically advantageous to construct foundries in the united states so these subsidies mean that maybe the price doesn't have to go up quite as much i am of the opinion that the solution to a lot of our woes is decentralization and on some level deglobalization. Like we've globalization has been good for a lot of things, but as we know, it lifted a lot of boats and caused a lot of boats to sink. And it also means really, really, really long, really inefficient and really like climate damaging supply chains 
and frankly, construction in ways that like could be a lot cleaner and safer if we were doing it here, which is not, that is not a knock on TSMC. They're doing a great job, right? But we've all heard horror stories about chip manufacturing in China and at extraction. Yeah, the, the whole minerals. buy local thing, you know, that the, you know, nearest farmer's market tells you, like that actually applies to lots of things. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. food, food, national, food electronics, you know, question. all sorts of stuff. Look not at a place all the, for like, a bargain, though. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But you know what? Some stuff should be a bargain. Well, sure. Yeah. And I, I also, uh, for our international uh, audience, want, want to add that uh, we're talking about it as it, it shortens the supply chain for us. Anything made in the U.S. that would then have to be exported would lengthen the supply chain. So that's where it comes to decentralization that you're talking about, Molly, which is Japan, Europe, Vietnam. Uh, right. And and what I wish Following I would see is more development in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, places like that. There is a lot going into India as well. So I think there's a lot to be said for the efficiency of decentralizing so that you are making things closer to the demand. I don't know that that's always the theory that's driving these sorts of, of plans, but maybe they'll have that effect anyway. Maybe. I think Maybe. I think we're on the we're on the verge of a really big geopolitics conversation. That's probably a whole other podcast. Yeah, you should no, start exactly. That, Tom, you don't have enough. <laughs> yeah, I should. <laughs> Why not? Uh, just to add a, just to add another one uh, to the pile. But yeah, yeah there, there's so many other things we could talk about, which is you know comparative advantage and mercantilism <laughs> and all that sort of See? stuff. See, I knew yeah. it. I had to get mercantilism before we were done with this. It was really it just, just a yeah. matter of time. It was, it, 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 people would be disappointed. It was on my bingo cards. So Drink, yeah, Bing, yeah. yeah, check it off right now. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Oh, uh, this is a good one from Allison Sheridan writing in with the subject line, why I want a Google Pixel. So I was intrigued. Allison says, yesterday I found a backpack with a purse stuffed inside it across the street from my house. As it turns out, both had been stolen from cars at gas stations. The purse had a woman's wallet inside with her driver's license and some insurance cards. With some online sleuthing, Steve and I figured out the phone number for her husband called the number, and of course, they didn't answer because it was an unknown number. I hung up, called again. This time I heard, hello, this is the Google Voice Assistant. The person who owns this number would like to know what this call is in regards to. I explained I had the purse. Instantly, the husband picked up his phone. I was delighted that I was able to reunite her with her belongings, but only because he knew that this was a real and not a spam call. I told him I thought the Google Voice Assistant feature was awesome in a way to screen calls, and he said it comes standard with the Google Pixel. Mm hmm Yep. I have it on my uh, Pixel I mean, Fold. let us never be in that position, but man, if I lose my stuff, I would love this. That's you can also have it navigate phone in. trees for you, too. That too, yeah. Wait, what does that mean, navigate phone trees? Like, you know, have it press one. Yeah, like oh, if you have to call oh, Kaiser oh, instead of like system. doing that, uh -huh. it just yep. calls you when it's done with everything. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, she could also just text the husband and be like, hi, I found your wife's purse on back. <laughs> but still, yeah, but that's not as good of a story. <laughs> that's a really cool feature. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm going to call it right now. Allison, who does a podcast with a slight Apple bias, saying this ahead of a WWDC where Apple is expected to show off whiz bang on device AI, I think means this is coming to iOS. I think mm -hmm. that's the equation I want to go with. I like the Kremlinology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, it's just reading the tea leaves, reading the signs. Good. It's good. Uh, and then Kevin wrote in with a pertinent question and Molly as an EV driver, you might be interested in this or maybe even know another answer. Uh, Kevin says, do you know if there are any roadside EV assistance services that could stop by and give you enough charge to get to a supercharger should you, you know, through poor planning, run out of charge. It would seem like that would be something we might see come about with the rise of EVs, and maybe a service like that might help some of the new EV buyers out there get over some of their range anxiety. Sort of, you know, the idea of calling AAA to have them bring out a can of gas for you. I found one in LA that does exactly that, they will they will come out and and bring a charger and charge you up enough to get home. Uh, Molly, have you heard of anything like this? I have seen some startups that really want to do this. I think that AAA actually 
is rolling it out or has rolled it out as of last year. So sense. that would, okay. that, so that's pretty much the game changer, right? When, yeah, when yeah. AAA does it. Um, but it's a great, it's a great point. Like you still have to be able to, and also most of the car manufacturers will do this. So if you've got, you know, whatever your car's version of OnStar, like my Polestar had a little SOS button and you could just be like, hey, help. And they would send somebody out to help you. I know Tesla has that. I'm sure all the other manufacturers have it in some form. Like BMW has got the same like SOS thing uh, built in. So yeah, it's starting and- to become a common offering for sure. Andy Toy says the uh, CAA in Canada, the the AAA in Canada, does this as well. So nice. There you go, Kevin. You're you're sorry that you can't do a startup in this space because he's you like, give it. me five percent cut if this <laughs> idea hasn't been done before. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, the fact that AAA or CAA can roll it out in one day is like why you should. Although you could be the person who makes the mobile battery truck. Somebody. Already yeah, there you go. That's a good I idea. mean, as somebody who has had AAA uh, uh, insurance for quite some time, you know big insurance company uh, for uh, for automobiles, I have had to have somebody come out and give me just a little gas to get to the nearest gas station more times than I would like to admit. <laughs> things happen. So if you're, you know, if you're driving an EV and things happen, this is, yeah, this is, I, I think this would be something that would be built into insurance companies going yeah. forward. Yep. Yeah, pretty, pretty standard offering. So don't let that stop you. Go ahead and get one because they're so fast. I know. They're so fast. That's, great. <laughs> That's the biggest reason. I'm just going to keep telling you, you know, like everybody's like, this is why not to, and this is why not to. I'm yeah, like, we talk about EVs on the that? show a lot. Do you want sure, to go Sure, sure, save the environment, whatever. Just but. get one. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Right. Go fast. Yeah. Well, you know, going fast. You know, you know. Autobahn. Anyway. Uh, Molly Wood, such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Let folks know where we can keep up with your latest. I love it. You can find me at everybodyinthepool.com or the Everybody in the Pool podcast is wherever you like to podcast. Um, as it happens, I am shortly, I've published two so far and I'm working on part three of my EV buying guide which answers all of these kind of fundamental questions about like, what is it like to own one and what you should be looking for. And so I appreciate this and I'm going to include it in the next guide. Excellent. Perfect timing. Go check that out, Kevin, that and and all of you, not just Kevin, all, anyone named Kevin or not Kevin. Yeah. yeah. Whatever all the Kevins is, and totally the rest. Yeah. Kevins and non-Kevins alike are welcome. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, and we've got another quiz. We are going to test your knowledge of U.S. chip companies, U.S. semiconductor companies. Can you figure out the answer before our contestants do? Stick around. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Roger. Uh, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20, 100 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you have a great weekend. We're back on Monday live from Vegas with Scott Johnson and Brian Ibbett joining Tom. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beat Master, W. Scott S1. BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese. Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Justin Robert Young, Scott Johnson, Nika Monford, Chris Christensen, and Molly Wood. Our guest this week was Charlotte Henry. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>